This has been a, such an interesting conference and my colleagues and I are really grateful for the opportunity to share with you today. Uh, I'm Tess Settergren, formerly I was the Director of Nursing Informatics at Cedars-Sinai Health System and now I'm sort of retired. <clears throat> Oops, excuse me. Today, <clears throat> we will briefly review the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science Initiative that provides oversight and guidance for some of our work efforts. Then we're gonna talk about the development of this very important nursing information model, followed by our analysis of the key concepts and value sets, the clinical element model mapping and gap analysis, and culminating in the development of fire profiles. We will take you on our pain journey for about 40 minutes, and then we will be very pleased to take any questions or comments that you might have. The Nursing Knowledge Big Data uh, Science Initiative was launched in 2013 when a group of pretty high powered nurse leaders from academia, hospitals and health systems, uh, electronic health record and other system vendors, consulting firms, government, professional nursing organizations all came together to, to determine how to achieve this vision. <clears throat> Most but not all of the nurse leaders at the inaugural conference specialize in nursing informatics and have witnessed the successes and challenges around use of health information technologies to enhance patient and family outcomes, improve population health, and to reduce costs, but also to optimize the impacts on nurses and other clinicians using these systems. While our focus uh, today is on the structured data and information entered by, by nurses, we do, of course, think about this in the context of care teams, and we recognize that other clinicians also enter some of the same data into the systems. But we can't boil the ocean, so we focus our efforts right now on nurse-entered data, and we hope that our colleagues can benefit. This is the framework that the Nursing Knowledge Big Data Science uh, has used uh, to uh, structure some of our work. Uh, human factors, environmental factors, system factors, and certainly others I'm not naming play a big part in how we deliver healthcare to patients, families, communities, and populations within a wide range of care settings and care models. And care teams vary greatly with setting. Health policy varies from federal to state and among states. And as we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, analytics can be inconsistent. Standards are incredibly important for shareable and comparable data and information. So this uh, framework has been used to design a work group structure intended to tackle some of those issues. So these are the work groups. Um, <clears throat> they've, uh, the number has grown a little bit over the years. Uh, and I think the relationships between work groups uh, has changed. And we morph a little uh, every year to align with current gaps and needs identified during our annual conference. And today you're gonna to hear from the knowledge modeling and the encoding modeling work groups and from our partners working to create the clinical element models and fire profiles in HL7, as well as ensuring that the content is represented in Law Against Nomad CT. So to start us off, Kay Lytle, Chief Nursing Information Officer for Duke University Health System, We'll talk about the development of the pain information model. Go Kay. So the pain information model was developed uh, several years ago um, and it was a collaborative group of uh, the information modeling at that time work group that Tess mentioned. And our process has really evolved over time. And uh, Tess, if you'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is the most recent process that we're using as we develop and validate the various information models. And you can see the high level scope analysis design and validate steps. And then we have kind of the disseminate process uh, across the bottom. Um, I think the things that we're doing more recently, uh, I would just point out is better engagement of subject matter experts uh, using literature and uh, data standards early along with use cases to help us set up uh, what we're going what we're going to validate in the model. 
and you can go to the next slide. The work is really based off of work done by Bonnie Wester and a group of people out of the uh, University of Minnesota where 10 information models were originally um, developed based on one health system that had about 2.4 million patient records. And we decided to start with pain as a very important concept. And yeah, obviously uh, at the time and still today, pain is assessed by everyone. It was a very uh, commonly occurring problem. Uh, the opioid epidemic was, I think, at the forefront at the time. Um, and so this seemed like a very timely topic for us to address as far as trying to validate the model. So this gives you one of the things that we did um, is to pull the metadata from about eight health systems uh, that, were that were voluntary participants in the information modeling work group. And the data that we received was not patient specific it, uh, as far as PHI in it. So you can see on here, we would have the template or basically the flow sheet that people documented on um, so adult assessment, for example, the group. So there might be a pain group where people assess their pain. And then they would have individual rows that, that typically re represented the concept. So pain, type of pain, exacerbating factors. And then the value sets would be the choices in the flow sheet people had to document. And then kind of to the right, you see the example of uh, where people might have documented on specific dates and times. So we did have discrete data. So we knew how often concepts were documented and what choices were used, um, but there was no patient context at all. And then the, that was the data that we used. So validation of all of that data across the organizations. We took the reference information model and basically added um, a number of new concepts to them on this. They're represented in red, so pain pattern. A number of new pain scales were added, which I think just represents the diversity of the groups that we added, where additional tools were used. And then we added pain goals. We had original model had interventions and outcomes, but not necessarily the pain goal. And I believe the next slide it gives an example. The one thing the original reference models did not include were the value sets. So um, in the validation work, we did include and validate the, the value set specifically. So there's two examples on here, um, the, pain, you know, the pain quality and then uh, the pain location. And some of these could be rather large lists and then uh, develop synonyms as well because of the differences that we might have across organizations just where we used a different term to re that really represented the same thing. So overall, the work that we did with uh, eight sites represented the 6.6 .6 million patients. And we really tried to capture the most important concepts that were in flow sheet documentation. So obviously we did not have the medication administration record, for example, or the provider-driven problem list, but we did capture you know, a large volume of the data that nurses chart and others are captured discreetly in the flow sheets. Um, we had overall thir the 30 concepts, the four panels, and the 396 value set items I mentioned that we added that were new. We did actually reduce some concepts even with that work. So you can see there we reduced 84 concepts, 14 panels, and 599 um, value set items. And then um, you can see what the, what the LOINC mapping was. Really, when we passed the work, over to the encoding and modeling team, that was really where they um, facilitated all of that work for us. So with that, I think I pass it back to Tess to let her talk about uh, where they took off, where when we passed them the information model. Great, thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, encoding modeling work group uh, initiatives. Uh, the group was launched in 2014 by Susan Matney to codify nursing data and information in clinical information systems. In 2014, nursing observation data was pretty sparse in LOINC, with the exception of some skin and wound, ass wound assessments and vital signs. So our work group concluded a project in 2016 
that ensured a basic head-to-toe nursing assessment was represented in LOINC. Um, and the 15 or so new physiologic, or maybe they weren't all new, physiologic assessment panels included a basic pain assessment panel, but the new pain knowledge model really expanded the pain assessment content. And our job was to analyze the content, prepare it for the next steps in the process, but also to start documenting and refining our own processes and the rules so that others could undertake similar projects without recreating the wheel and also ensuring that others used um, the relatively new interoperability standards for nursing data. So um, to speak just a little bit about that, the Office of the National Coordinator first published nursing data standards, I believe in 2017. I could be wrong, it could have been 2016, sorry. Um, and it was not a coincidence at all that our work group had been grappling with that standards gap. And many thanks to Susan Matney, for her tireless leadership in promulgating standards because she had a big part in uh, getting these standards uh, published. There's been several changes uh, each year, and, and I think we need to note that outside of the US, SNOMED has typically been used for all of the nursing process components, including observations. But here in the US, LOINC is the standard for observations or assessment questions. SNOMED CT is the standard for observation values or answers except when the value set is part of a validated instrument or tool, like the pain scales, uh, or Braden or Morse or all kinds of other scales. Um, so nursing problems and interventions are in SNOMED CT. Nurse sensitive outcomes will be found in LOINC when the observation values are measurements, and in SNOMED CT, basically, when the observation values are an assertion, like when you say the patient is normal tensive, or an observed assessment, such as when you say, um, something is improved. So let's look at an example from the pain model. In this example, um, the LOINC assessment is a point in time patient reported finding of pain quality. We do have an example answer list in LOINC to help demonstrate the meaning, but the answers or values are sensation qualifier values that live in SNOMED CT. And just uh, to note that not all sensation qualifier values were used because not all sensation qualities are pain or related to pain. Uh, for instance, the sensation qualities of hot and cold are not really, uh, you know, typically uh, thought of as pain sensation. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the pain assessment uh, tools, but um, because we're working on some of those now, but um, the, the, both the observations and the answer lists for each are all normative and they can only live in like. Uh, they can't be added to or changed or whatever. The nursing problem of pain is a clinical finding in SNOMED CT. Um, we didn't model any of the children of pain because, and the only condition they can use is uh, the one shown. And nursing interventions are found in SNOMED CT as a subset of pain management. Uh, procedures, um, a procedure, I should say. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our process. When we worked on the nursing physiologic assessment project, our work group followed a data collection process really similar to the knowledge modeling work group that Kay uh, was talking about. We gathered the nursing documentation metadata, prioritized the observations by volume, etc. Um, but, and then we would review uh, add definitions, but now we really start um, more with, um, well, the second, I guess the second step and the uh, third step are more commonly where we would start with um, uh, the models turned over to us by Kay and, and Bonnie's group. Um, with the pain model, which was earlier work, we did need to add definitions, ask for a lot of clarifications to ensure that the observations were unique and non-ambiguous. And we did need to decompose uh, quite a few pre-coordinated observations. And I think it's helpful to understand that nursing documentation in electronic health records is quite often pre-coordinated to the greatest possible extent for efficiency. Documentation burden is evaluated by the number of clicks. Uh, physicians will resonate with that too. And less clicks means more time for value-added activities. And by that, I mean, nursing activities that make a difference to patients. And in addition, the pre-coordinated terms in documentation help to provide some of the context of the observation. 
pain speed of onset, pain course, pain duration. But you will know that, that speed of onset, clinical course, and duration could be observed in many other situations. So we just expect that we will need to decompose some of the pre-coordinated terms that are in models um, and appropriately um, displayed that way in models. Once we ensure that the observations are unique, we have to make sure that the values are congruent with the defined observation because many times we find some sort of mixed value sets. So um, once the concepts are decomposed and unique, we use the literature uh, as needed, assign definitions. Uh, sometimes we have to go back to uh, the knowledge management or the knowledge modeling group. Um, and then we realign the values to ensure semantic consistency. So the right values are with the right concepts. And I'm describing this process as if each step is completed before the next step is initiated, but that's not real. The handoff process is and really has to be much more iterative to ensure that we are appropriately uh, representing the concepts for mapping and for new code submissions. So we map the observations uh, then to LOINC and the values to SNOMED CT. Uh, and I'm talking about assessments, um, but you know, that's where we're at right now uh, working on. And where exact matches exist, I should say too. In some cases, we have found pre-existing link panels. Um, I think because the data standards are better defined now, we've also discovered that some existing panels need a few corrections, uh, some errors, some concepts that are pre-coordinated uh, or just not in the right spot. Um, and also with pre-coordination, the current interoperability standard is to post-coordinate. So we really have to look at, um, at those pre-existing uh, um, concepts and their value sets. Where gaps exist in LOINC and or SNOMED CT, we develop content request spreadsheets. Um, and I think we've become so much better at defining observations and the values and that really facilitates mapping and requesting new concepts. Oh, and I forgot to, I'm talking away and I forgot to advance my slides, I'm so sorry. Uh, but I'm done with this now and you'll have the slides. So, um, this might be a little bit hard to read, I think it's okay, but I want to give you a little flavor of content, ref of the content refining process and how, what happens. Um, so this was the original pain information model, pain context as, um, an observation and you can see that it's defined as the circumstances that form the setting for an event in which pain is assessed. And the thought here was to capture when the patient experienced pain. Is it during activity? Is it at rest? Um, it makes a difference. Uh, or at various points of procedure or treatment processes. So the context is a, a qualifier for when pain is assessed. And in the clinical element modeling, there's an associated precondition that describes previously existing conditions or states that could affect a measurement or assessment. So nurses were using the word context and it was, um, I think, discovered that th this definition uh, was actually a, a pretty good match with context. So, um, so this is sort of the refinement to context. Um, and also the original value set was missing post-activity. Um, and then again, after a lot of discussion about the difference between treatment and procedure in the previous slide, there wasn't one. So nurses can still use the terms before, during, and after treatment, but they will map to before, during, and after procedure qualifiers. And this one is a little bit of an eye chart, and I apologize for that. Um, but I, what I wanted to point out is that there are still a few outstanding questions here and there that we have to, do, to address. Some of the values um, still need a little bit of defining. This is a list of the pain quality values. Um, and so the values that are in yellow are contraction, deep, and penetrating, and they still need some discussion. And remember, the value sets come from real electronic health record flow sheet documentation. These are words patients have used. Um, and um, so we're built into people's electronic health records. So when we need further explanation, we actually uh, either go to subject matter experts or SMEs directly, 
or we request that the knowledge modeling group um, go back to their SMEs for definitions if that's more appropriate. I talked a little bit about the pain assessment scales or just mentioned them earlier. That's kind of the last big project for the pain model that the encoding modeling work group is uh, tackling. And I will say it has not been without its challenges. Um, so this list is the list that we're currently working on. With, there's a few that were already in LOINC. There's a few that are for fee, so they can't be in LOINC. Although we're still hoping that we maybe can um, get the total score and the nursing interpretation into LOINC. But I do wanna talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, first of all, finding the developers, like a lot of them have retired um, and can't even be found. Then also ensuring that the tool actually has sufficient evidence. We wanna make sure that there's good evidence for reliability and validity before we pop it into LOINC. Who owns the copyright permission? Is it the developer? Is it the publishing journal? We've run into that a little bit. Um, and then the process for ensuring accurate and complete representation in LOINC with developer sign-off is really valuable and necessary, but it's lengthy. Um, it's taken us a fair amount of time to do that, so the, which is why we're a little bit behind on this. Uh, and, you know, the developers were clinicians, our clinicians, and some of the observations were not well defined. Uh, so it, they didn't have conceptual definitions, for instance, uh, and the, the definitions were not always uh, very clean, and there's no single way to define a component that might appear to be the same in two different pain assessment scales. Um, so those are like some of the challenges we've run into. But um, I think our efforts to, you know, really make sure that we have clear, unambiguous definitions for the assessment questions and answers um, have been fairly successful. Uh, and then we've also been able to include a nursing interpretation of the score, which is really helpful for folks using the scales. So that was a whirlwind, and I am now very pleased to pass the baton to Dr. Susan Matney, who I'm sure is known well to many of you, if not in person, then surely through her prodigious body of work in the standard space. So thank you, and Susan, I'm going to stop sharing. Hi, everybody. I, um... I'm happy to be here, and I am Susan Matney, and I work for Intermountain Healthcare and Logica Health, and my role is to develop um, the, the information, the logical models, and we use the clinical element modeling language that I'll tell you about, and, um, and get that ready for um, the FIRE development. So just, a uh, real quick overview of the process we use. Once the domain analysis is done um, and Susan, everything. Can I stop yeah? you and ask you to expand your slides? Expand. I think the um, one of those buttons you on the bottom. just switch your monitors. Swap the presenter view and slideshow. So, oh, swap. OK. So there. there you Thank you. OK, um, good. Thank you. So um, once the domain analysis is done, we start creating the clinical element logical models, and then those are approved by the subject matter experts. Um, they're put in a repository of, with, of fire profiles that anybody can use to um, create apps. Um, so the clinical element model is a model of specific healthcare domains. and. We, um, we model assertions, um, conditions, it, it aligns with conditions, medication, administration, observations, and the model combines terminology and structures, um, and we have specific data element specifications. The clinical element modeling language is expressed as XML, um, and it's independent of specific implementation or messaging standards. We're often asked, why do you use clinical element and not just go to fire? Well, the clinical element model can be transformed to fire. It can be transformed to CDA. It can be at, transformed to DICOM. It is a, a platform independent so that we can use it for multiple ways. Plus, with all the different versions, now fire going to version five, 
Ours doesn't change. We may add a value to a value set, but our models don't change. We have a, um, an element hierarchy that, ha uh, that starts with statement-based, and then there's clinical assertion, observation, procedure. All of these are our base types that we create models from. Um, so for, and this is an, an example of, of pain assertion that's coming from the base type. You can see it's a kind of statement. Um, the base is clinical assertion. And then we've just put a few qualifiers in here so that you can see, you know, duration, pain radiation, exacerbating factors, um, and then also flock. Every one of these elements is bound to a standard terminology. Um, oftentimes, because we're doing this, um, we work in, in collaboration with, Sol with Solar from the VA as well as clinical architecture. So we have the ability to, um, in some medical and um, bind to both the observation, um, bind the observation to both SNOMED and LOINC. So uh, oftentimes when you browse our models, you'll see them in both SNOMED and LOINC. This is a picture of the clinical assertion base type. And so this is the high level base type. And so every clinical assertion has a code. And then there's other elements that are qualifying elements that qualify that assertion. Um, so you can see there's a description, date of onset, severity, course, um, episodicity, and so all these qualifying elements, um, many align with FIRE, and so we have a transform from our clinical element um, design and review tool called CEDAR straight to FIRE, so we can transform our, our clinical elements to FIRE. So when we model, we align the clinical element base type um, of similar objects. And in this case, pain is an assertion, but there's observations that are, are qualifying observations underneath that. So we, we really align to, um, to both. We identify the base type instant types, um, like pain severity, and we review clinical element models that already exist. If it exists, we evaluate the value set. And in our case, with pain, we already had pain um, uh, sensation quality, and we needed to revise the value set to align with this new, um, um, better work. So it, this is where we start looking at the clinical element model alignment. So you can see what the pain information model has inside of it on the right-hand side. And so, when, when a model, if you have pain as the code, then you don't need to have pain within the, the qualifying observations. So you can see that pain body location, we aligned with, with uh, body location. Pain type, they, we, you can, from what case, if you were really looking at it semantically, it had acute and chronic and then it had labor and chest and so we broke it into two things and so in this case pain type aligned with our clinical course qualitative frequency aligned with already an element that we had and then the context um, what test showed you was associated precondition we had several meetings and we decided that procedures um, uh, we're not a really a condition and so we we've renamed it to associated situation and and then um, just similarly I'm lost focus for some reason um, so the associated sign and symptom and um, and then the course we are we already had trend which is improving or worsening an interesting thing to to note though is we um, we found items in the pain model that we wanted to add to the high level clinical assert base. And so speed of onset, temporal pattern, exacerbating and alleviating factors, we felt like all conditions could use those, all assertions. And so we added those to the base type. So if we add fatigue now, you can have alleviating and exacerbating factors for fatigue. Um, so, and then there's, uh, you can see there's qualifiers that we extend the, uh, 
the assertion pattern with just for pain. So um, we have terminology mapping heuristics, um, when and some of these tests elaborated on. So so one of the things is is observation values should not include the observation question. So if you have pain quality is a burning sensation quality, not burning pain. This, and this is the, some of the pre-post coordination is, coordinated issues. Body location is post-coordinated. Now we can create isosemantic models that shows how it maps to pain if we wanted to have you know, knee pain for the orthopedic surgeons. I'm going to have a knee replacement, so I understand that. Um, the condition uh, doesn't need to be in the qualifying element name because it's inherited. So um, we, ha we have intermittent, we have temporal pa pattern is intermittent, not intermittent pain. So this is some real nice heuristics um, for you to go back to as you start looking at information modeling where you're at and, and real recognize what's pre versus post coordinated. Then we curate the content um, into, into LOINC and SNOMED CT. Our, um, we use the solar um, from, in the VA. We have an extension namespace. And we also are getting an extension namespace within Symmetical. So we can extend SNOMED and then submit that to um, SNOMED CT. And then all of the LOINC is requested from Reagan Streif. Um, and they are incredible to work with. Um, when what's fun is is the nursing um, terminology and modeling work group are now curating their content. It's not me that's doing it all by myself. I've mentored people to do it for, to it too. So this is the LOINC assessment panel. You can see this. Um, this is just showing the L forms view, which I love when I'm showing a clinician, and. Um, some of the new additions that are just coming out in the next release from this work is uh, you can see pain category, nonverbal pain indicator, you know, grimacing, crying, yelling, and um, and then all our value sets are curated uh, and, and put into the Value Set Authority Center. So if you want to go see the value sets that we've created for pain. You can just go in the NLM. Um, uh, right now, HSPC is the steward. Logic has changed from HSPC, and we haven't updated the name in VSAC. And then this is just showing a pain associated sign and symptom value set just to show um, some of the values that we have from SNOMED CT. So, how am I doing for t time? Um, so, here's, here's the CEML to LOINC model binding. Um, there is a, uh, you can see the code for pain is a SNOMED CT code. This is a condition that would be messaged as a fire condition, which Nathan will show you. And then here's the pain severity uh, score, which is a LOINC code. And with that, I'll pass it to um, Nathan, who will talk about how we transform things to fire. Thank you, Susan. So how do we get all of that information from the subject matter experts, the information modelers, and the clinical information modelers into something that we can use to exchange data. Uh, next slide, please. FHIR, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on what is FHIR, but I think most people have heard of it and seen use cases in it. It's basically an exchange standard created by Graham Greve in 2011. He shortly after that donated it to Health Level 7. And it consists of a set of computable components called resources. And these resources describe things like patient location and observation condition and several others. Um, these resources can build a web within their use via the use of references. So one resource can reference another. So if you have an observation where you want to know which device that observation was done on, um, it will reference a different resource called device. Um, these resources can then be exchanged between system using RESTful APIs. And REST is how the internet works. And you can bundle these 
resources into messages or documents or other types of, of bundles so you can exchange that data. The issue with the resources, go, ahead and go back one slide, please. One issue with the resources is when they created FHIR, they used what's called an 80-20 rule. So these base resources contain 80%, well, they contain data that 80% of people would use. The issue with that is oftentimes when you talk about specific conditions or observations that want to, you want to make, such as pain, that 80% doesn't cover all of the information you need. Things like what we, what we saw in the model, duration and speed of onset and many other things that we would want to include with your pain assessment that are not in the base resource. They did create a, a means of capturing that through what they call profiling or adding extensions to the base resources. Next slide, please. FHIR consists of there are 120 plus and counting resources, base resources. And this is just a small set of those. Those that are bolded in red are the ones that we have used so far for the pain assessment implementation guide, condition, observation, questionnaire value set. We will be creating a, a questionnaire response and possibly a couple of other different profiles. Next slide, please. So how do we get from clinical element modeling language or the CEM to the fire mapping. As you can see on the left-hand side, the CEML contains the data for pain assessment. And we, as Susan mentioned, we can constrain that or bind it to the SNOMED CT ID for the pain binding. That would then in turn map to what the fire condition resource to the condition code. You can see that on the fire resource in our profile, we have constrained it to be the system of SNOMED with the SNOMED ID for the code and the, the SNOMED fully specified name for its display. And similarly to that, we can then bind the other things such as duration. Go ahead and advance, please. So duration would map to an extension since the condition resource doesn't include a duration, duration element. We would extend that with a duration extension and pain character would be an extension and so on. Next slide, please. So this is an example of what the resulting profile would look like. And I will actually, in a minute, uh, bring up the implementation guide so we can go through it. But as you can see, we have several extensions in here, those elements with the green circles next to them. So we have a duration extension, pain radiation, and so on. And we have constrained the code of this condition to be the SNOMED CT code with its system, its ID value, and its display. Next slide, please. And similar to this, this is what a questionnaire resource would look like. And if you look at this, the item, the question one item, we have constrained this one or bound it to the LOINC term for duration. You can see its system is LOINC with its value of 38207-7 and its display of duration, as well as the text of the question. How long does or did the pain last? Next slide, please. With that, Susan, if you'll hand over control to me, I will display the, the uh, implementation guide. Gonna have to be fast. Yeah. Five minutes or less. <laughs> I will be quick. So this is what the implementation guide looks like currently. And this is a current integration build, meaning it will- You're not displaying yet. Oh, I thought I was. Okay, I should be now. So this is yes. the implementation guide. Uh, again, this is a current, current integration build, meaning it can and probably will change often until we're ready to take this to ballot. So if we look at the profiles I just described, and let's look at the questionnaire first. So the questionnaire, as you can see, consists of several different questions, each one of which is bound to or constrained to a specific link code. So the first question, duration, has this code, then pain radiation is going bound to the link, this link code, and so on. And we did this as much as possible 
um, some of these questions don't have link terms yet. And so you'll notice through this that periodicity, we couldn't find an, uh, a link term to match this, so we didn't do any binding on that. And there's a few in there like that. So the questionnaire profile then for pain assessment, uh, this could be used to create a, a form in a computerized system where a nurse would ask the patient about their pain, its duration, all of its qualifying elements. And then these answers would then be used to inform the pain assertion, the assertion that your patient has pain. And then those answers would go into the values for all of the extensions that we've added to our profile. So this is the pain assertion profile. And you can see that each one of these extensions has bindings to value sets. So if we look at the alleviating factor, this is a value set of things that would be used. Uh, for some reason, it's not displaying. Let's look at a different one. So this set for sudden, for the speed of onset, for the answers given in the questionnaire, was it a sudden onset or was it a gradual onset? Um, what we don't wanna, the reason we use value sets is so that we don't have information that doesn't make sense to a speed of onset for a condition. And so that, that then becomes the bindings Susan talked about in the, both the clinical element model and the fire profile. And we can do that for nearly all of the different elements within the profile. And again, the assertion.code or the condition.code is bound to the SNOMED term for pain finding. And one last thing I want to show you is we are also working on some observations like the flock pain assessment scale, which is based on the observation resource. And you can see that the observation is bound to the flock pain assessment scale, and it has several components for the face, legs, activity, um, pain, the cry, consolability, and the total score. And each one of these is constrained to its respective link code. And with that, I will turn the back time back over to Tess. Sorry, coming, it's coming. <clears throat> oh, and I wasn't keeping up with the... <laughs> so, weird. Trying to skip to the bottom one. Oh my God, never mind. Um, I think um, we did a whirlwind tour and uh, we, I'm gonna just get out of this. Never mind. We did a whirlwind tour um, of our pain uh, process, and um, we talked about everything from the information, the original knowledge model development through uh, the analysis of data and the um, uh, resulting um, uh, clinical element model. And Don't you hate it when you just like totally freeze up, man? Love of God. Anyway. Wait, let me share, Tess. Why don't you? Yeah, just stop sharing and I'll take it because I've got it in the right place. Thank you. You guys are doing fine. <laughs> While Susan's bringing that slide up, um, we do have some time for questions. We hope you have some. Um, and um, I guess it looks like there's a couple in the Q&A. We have some references here uh, and we certainly have uh, submitted our contact information, so you'll have that. Uh, but it looks like we might have a couple of questions. Okay, great. So this is David Bayordo from the LOINC team, and um, I would like to read out the questions to you so that we have them on the, on the record. Awesome. So uh, we have a couple from John Snyder. 
Um, will the nursing work group be requesting that SNOMED codes that exist in the local organizational extension be promoted to either the US extension or the international edition so uh, they can be used nationally or internationally? Uh, question mark. And then uh, there's some uh, other parts of that question, but maybe if you could start with that. So, hi, John. So, um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and um, the hard part is to when to know when. We've worked with SNOMED and we know that we need to submit it to the U.S. extension to get it in the international version. And so I've, we've, we've chatted with Susie Roy. Um, you know, as we keep going, we just are built, we just built the fire profile and uh, still tweaking things. Um, like with vital signs, we just took that to ballot for the ex all the qualifying um, qualifiers on vital signs and have things coming back to us. So we're not not exactly sure when, but we yes, we do have a process that we are going to submit all of the extension content into the U.S. extension, and then that can be promoted to international. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer. Um, John had another question. Um, fire profiles are assigned a basic level of maturity. How quickly do you anticipate that the pain profile being advanced to a mature standard? Well, the, the maturity process actually takes some time. Uh, it's based on first balloting and then implementation. Um, because pain assessment is in its infancy as far as fire implementation guides go, we do plan on taking that through the maturity process. It's going to take some time though. We need to first run a connectathon for this and then send it to ballot. And then once we get that going, we need to look for people who are willing to implement in their systems and so on. So, but I guess the short answer to that is yes, we plan on taking it through the maturity process, but it will take some time. And I guess one plug is one of the challenges we have with the nursing big data not initiative is, is we've got these models, but we need implementers. And so, I mean, we're changing documentation in systems now from it, but we need in order to to get these to ballot, we are required to do a connectathon. So if anybody on the call wants these fire profiles to play with or to start encoding their apps and, and be involved in a connectathon, please let us know. Yes, the help would be very much appreciated. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, there are no more questions on the box, but I, I, had, a, I had one that uh, came to mind. Um, so I, I really found your discussion fascinating. Um, uh, the areas around the terminology issues and the mapping heuristics. And what I wanted to ask is when, you, when do you see pre versus post coordinated mapping to LOINC as being useful? What, what situations would you say that you would use pre versus post? And the reason I ask that is, um, you know, a lot of the LOINC terms we have say in pain area, and this is not my particular area of expertise in LOINC, but um, I've just noticed that, you know, they are pre-coordinated uh, uh, to a certain extent. Um, you know, we have pain, um, you know, radiation, pain severity, pain duration, and those are some of the terms I've seen in your talk uh, that you've mapped to. So when would you consider that, you know, versus a more generic model where you just say pain in one field and duration in another where is it where you did allude to that at one point. So I just wanted to just get a sense of that, of where you see pre versus uh, post. The, the place that we're already doing it, and I can start it and then may, and, and if Nathan can add to it, is lab. Um, you, you know, glucose after they have drank glucagon is a measurement of glucose. And so um, uh, and then some of the methods that, that we are post coordinating so you can track vital signs, you know, the systolic on the brachial artery and the, the systolic lying, the systolic sitting, the systolic after exercise, the, all of those um, could potentially be pre coordinated um, in fire profiles so that the clinicians, but when does the post coordination happen? You know, we've talked to Cerner and said, if you do a blood pressure, after and during anesthesia, 
then this is how you post coordinate it in your you in the in the services. Um, so it's an interesting uh, an interesting question about when and where do you pre and post coordinate? Mm -hmm. Right, and the the real question for pre and post coordination, as far as clinical information modeling comes in, is at one time when do I create a model or a profile for glucose measure two hours after administration of 100 milliliters of glucagon? You could take that and use the pre coordinated term and the lab can send the link code for that term and store the data into the EHR and all that kind of stuff. It's difficult to take that then with all of the other types of glucose that could be modeled and start to do research on that. Because you'd have to say, I want all the glucoses that include all, uh, there are a lot of different pre coordinated glucose link terms. So when do, you know, is my query gonna say, give me every single type of glucose link code I could think of, or just give me glucose where the qualifier could be the, the timing, the fasting status, and something else. So the issue, and that's not an issue, but the way that could be resolved is through isosemantic modeling, as Susan mentioned, where you'd have one glucose model and profile that could cover all of those things through the extensions or the qualifiers associated with that. And then you'd have a map between the very specific pre-coordinated terms and how they would be uh, deconstructed into a post-coordinated model. And then that way both worlds could be satisfied and you know, ease of use could be done with the pre-coordinated and the, the ease of research could be done with the post-coordinated. And that's just as one example of of when and why you would want to do that kind of thing. All right. Well, we're we're kind of you know thinking in terms of you know an ontological representation that lets you do exactly that kind of thing, um, where you know just you want all the terms where you know glucose is the core analyte or the you know the analyte, irrespective of the com the t the full component, whether the full component has a challenge or not. You know, you still just want glucose the analyte, and you know using uh, information available in the link right now, you, you actually can do that, but just most people wouldn't have access or know how to do that. You know, like, you know, right. the part link file is so is complex and there's a lot of relationships and things in there. You could take all the link terms that have, you know, analyte of glucose and you'll get all exactly that query result, you know, but it's, it's not, it's sort of buried in there and, and it, it would be nice if we could somehow figure out a way to get that kind of information out. But I guess we've kind of gotten a little sidetracked with, with this question. So I noticed John Snyder has another one up there and I don't want to take up the rest of the time um, and not get to those to the uh, rest of the questions. So um, let me uh, ask John's question. Have you found the inability to represent emoticon type scale values like the Wong Baker scale to be prohibitive to your work in any way? Um, no, this is Susan again. And, and the answer is, um, we don't represent the form, you know, we represent the data that is that is messaged and the faces scale, you know, has a numeric, uh, you, know, it, you know, if they're crying, the face is crying extremely, it's, a, you know, it's a, an eight to a 10. Um, when I talked to Dr. Wong, she wanted to make sure um, to get the copyright, she wanted to make sure that we used her faces and so in the copyright information within the LOINC database, you know, they have, they have that the, they need to use the faces that has been published with the scale. Um, but that's an implementation issue and not a terminology and modeling issue. Right, the form used to record that could include images of the faces and their value. But as far as the fire profile and clinical element model are concerned, all that you would record would be the, the correlating data that goes with each face. So there's an integer value for each face and that's, that's what would be recorded. Okay, very good. Well, I don't see any further questions um, in the inbox. So I would like to, I guess at this point, if no one else has anything else to ask, um, to thank you for, really fascinating talk and really appreciate 
uh, you presenting here at the LOINC conference. And I guess we can adjourn the session and we will see you at the um, clinical committee meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. You so much. Thanks, okay. everybody. Okay, Thank bye. Bye-bye.